today we continue with the previous lecture which were about carbohydrates each molecule is made of many smaller monosaccharides monosaccharides are simple sugars like glucose special enzymes bind these small monomers together creating large sugar polymers or polysaccharides polysaccharide is also called a glycan a polysaccharide can be a homopolysaccharide in which all the monosaccharides are the same or heteropolysaccharides in which the monosaccharides vary depending on which monosaccharides are connected and which carbon in the monosaccharides connect polysaccharides take on a variety of forms a molecule with a straight chain of monosaccharides is called a linear polysaccharide with a chain that has arms and turns is known as a branched polysaccharide polysaccharides are most abundant carbohydrates that found in food they are long polymeric carbohydrate composed of monosaccharide units bound together by glycosidic glycosidic linkage this carbohydrate can react with water using amylase enzymes as catalyst which produces constituent sugars monosaccharides or oligosaccharides these include storage polysaccharides such as starch glycogen and galactogen and structural polysaccharides such as cellulose and chitin polysaccharides are often quite heterogeneous containing slight modification of the repeating unit depending on the structure these macromolecules can have distinct properties from their monosaccharide building blocks they may be amorphous or even insoluble in water polysaccharides contain more than 10 monosaccharide units whereas oligosaccharides contain 3 to 10 monosaccharide units polysaccharides are an important class of biological polymers their function in living organisms is usually either structure or storage related depending on their structure polysaccharides can have a wide variety of functions in nature some polysaccharides are used for storing energy some for sending cellular messages and others for providing support to cells and tissues many polysaccharides are used to store energy in organisms while the enzymes that produce energy only work on the monosaccharides stored in a polysaccharide polysaccharides typically fold together and can contain many monosaccharides in a dense area as the side chains of the monosaccharides form as many hydrogen bonds as possible with themselves water cannot intrude the molecules making them hydrophobic this property allows the molecules to stay together and are not dissolved into the cytosol this lowers the sugar concentration in a cell and more sugar can then be taken in not only do monos polysaccharides store the energy but they allow for changes in the concentration gradient which can influence cellular uptake of nutrients and water many polysaccharides become glycoconjugates when they become covalently bonded to proteins or lipids glycolipids and glycoproteins can be used to send signals between and within the cells proteins headed for a specific organelle 
may be tagged by certain polysaccharides that help the cell move it to a specific organelle. The polysaccharides can be identified by special proteins, which then help bind the proteins, vesicles, or other substance to a microtubule. The system of microtubules and associated proteins within cells can take any substance to its destined location once tagged by the specific polysaccharides. Multicellular organisms have immune systems driven by the recognition of glycoproteins on the surface of cells. The cells of a single organism will produce specific polysaccharides to adorn its cells with. When the immune system recognizes other polysaccharides and different glycoproteins, it's set into action and destroy the invading cells. The largest role of polysaccharide is that of support. All plants on earth are supported by the polysaccharide cellulose. Other organisms like insects and fungi use the chitin to support the extracellular matrix around their cells. A polysaccharide can be mixed with any number of other components to create tissues that are more rigid, less rigid or even materials with special properties. Between chitin and cellulose, both polysaccharides made of glucose monosaccharides, hundreds of billions of tons are created by living organisms every year. Everything from the wood in trees to the shells of seas creatures is produced by some form of polysaccharide. Simply by rearranging the structure, polysaccharides can go from storage molecules to much stronger fibrous molecules. All polysaccharides are uh, formed by the same basic process. Monosaccharides are connected via glycosidic bonds. When in a polysaccharide, Individual monosaccharides are known as residues. The structure of the molecules being combined determines the structure and properties of the resulting polysaccharide. The complex interaction between their hydroxyl groups, other side groups, the configurations of the molecules and the enzymes involved all affect the resulting polysaccharide produced. A polysaccharide used for energy storage will give easy access to the monosaccharide while maintaining a compact structure. A polysaccharide used for support is usually assembled as a long chain of monosaccharides which acts as a fiber. Many fibers together produce hydrogen bonds between fibers that strengthen the overall structure of the material. The glycosidic bonds between monosaccharides consist of an oxygen molecule bridging two carbon rings. The bond is formed when a hydroxyl group is lost from the carbon of one molecule. While the hydrogen is lost by the hydroxyl group of another monosaccharide, the carbon on the first molecule will substitute the oxygen from the second molecule as its own and glycosidic bond is formed. Because two molecules of hydrogen in one molecule is expelled, one oxygen molecule is expelled, the reaction produced a water molecule as well. This type of reaction is called a dehydration reaction as water is removed from the reactants. The most important storage polysaccharides on the planet, glycogen, and starch are produced by the animals and plants. These polysaccharides are formed from a central starting point and spiral outward due to their complex branching patterns.
with the help of various proteins that attach to the individual polysaccharides the large branched molecules from granules or clusters when a glycogen or starch molecule is broken down the enzymes responsible start at the ends furthest from the center this is very important as you will notice that because of the extensive branching there are only two starting points but many ends this means the monosaccharides can be quickly extracted from the polysaccharides and can be utilized for energy the only difference between the starches and glycogen is the number of branches that occur per molecule this is caused by different parts of the monosaccharides forming bonds and different enzymes acting on the molecules in glycogen a branch occurs every 12 and so resides while in starch a branch occurs only every 30 residues glycogen is basically the stored form of glucose that's made up of many connected glucose molecules glucose is your body's main source of energy it comes from carbohydrate in certain foods and fruits you consume when your body does not immediately need the glucose from the food you eat for energy it stores glucose in your muscles and liver as glycogen for later use your body creates glycogen from glucose through a process called glycogenesis your body breaks down glycogen for use through a process called glycogenolysis Several different enzymes are responsible for these two processes. As enzyme is a part of protein in a cell that act as a catalyst and allows certain bodily process to happen. There are thousands of enzymes throughout your body that have important functions. Your body mainly stores glycogen in your liver and skeletal muscles. with small amounts in your brain your liver stores a greater ratio of glycogen than your skeletal muscles since your total muscle mass is greater than that of your liver about 3 quarters of your body's total glycogen is in your muscles during intense and prolonged exercise the glycogen in your active muscle cells can substantially reduce the amount of glycogen in your liver cells varies throughout the each day depending on certain factors which include number of carbohydrates you consume the length of time between your meals the intensity and duration of recent physical activity after 12 hours to 24 hours of fasting liver glycogen is almost totally used up mainly uses the store of glycogen in your liver to help regulate your blood glucose levels your body normally carefully regulates your blood glucose with the hormones glucagon and insulin when your blood glucose level fall too low your pancreas releases more glucagon glucagon triggers the glycogen in your liver to convert back to glucose so it can enter your blood stream this process is called glycogenolysis when glucose is in your blood stream cells throughout your body can use it for energy the glycogen stores in your liver also partially help with muscles activity and exercise at the start of exercise your liver begins breaking down glycogen to maintain blood glucose level as your working muscles use it for energy your muscles primarily use their own glycogen stores to function muscle glycogen serves mainly as a source of metabolic fuel for your muscles your muscles need lots of energy to function in order for you to move if your muscles relied on glucose from your blood stream for this energy your body would quickly run out of glucose because of this 
your body stores three quarters of your total glycogen in all of your muscles so they have a consistent supply of energy especially during the exercise without dramatically affecting the levels of your blood glucose the rate at which your muscles glycogen reduces is related to the intensity of physical activity the greater the exercise intensity the greater the rate at which muscles glycogen runs out high intensity activity such as repeated sprinting can quickly lower glycogen stores in active muscle cells even though the total time of activity might be relatively brief your muscle stores with glycogen when you consume enough carbohydrates visual glycogen molecule is a branched polymer of d glucose in the pyranose form a stiff six member heterocyclic ring five carbons and one oxygen with chair conformation the central priming protein glycogenin and phosphate group are covalently bound to the polysaccharide chain most of the glucose units are linked by the alpha 1/4 glycosidic bonds where each unit is linked to the next by a bond between carbon number 1 of one unit and the hydroxyl group on the carbon number 4 of the next unit with an oxygen atom acting as a bridge between the two carbon atoms the branch points are introduced by alpha 1 sig glycosidic bonds that occur approximately every 8 to 12 residues again with an oxygen atom acting as a bridge between the two carbon atoms in this case carbon number 1 and carbon number 6 and with an average chain length of about 13 residues in mammals because each branch ends in a non reducing residues that are n plus 1 non reducing ends in the molecules where n is number of chains but only one reducing end to which glycogenin is having the same types of bonds the primary structure of glycogen resembles that of amylopectin which with amylose is one of the two polymers of d glucose units composing starch compared to amylopectin where branches occur every 25 to 30 glucose units glycogen is more branched and the branches are smaller unlike proteins and nucleic acid polysaccharides are synthesized without a template resulting from the addition of monosaccharides or oligosaccharides to the growing structure because branches occurs without a precise localization molecules with the same mass will not necessarily have the same structure for each type of molecules there are different chemical structures glycogen isolated from different biological sources exists as a population of molecules of different size the best way to describe its chemistry is to define the distribution of the molecular masses and the average frequency with which branches occurs and their average length glycogen is not a static entity but constantly vary over the course of its existing as glucose is a chiral molecule it exists as a pair of enantiomers indicating according to the fischer's convention as d glucose the most widespread in nature and the monomeric unit of glycogen starch and l glucose the folding into three dimensional structures of the macromolecules such as proteins nucleic acid and the polysaccharides is governed by the same principles the monomeric units namely amino acid nucleotides and monosaccharides with their more 
or less rigid structure are joined by covalent bonds to form one dimensional polymers that spontaneously fold into three dimensional structure stabilized by non covalent interactions such as um, hydrogen bonds hydrophobic interactions ionic interactions these interactions can occur within macromolecules or between the macromolecules as the pyranose rings glucose is a rigid structure the three dimensional conformation of the oligosaccharides and polysaccharides results from the rotation about carbon oxygen bonds of the glycosidic bond with the bond angles labeled there is no free rotation about each carbon oxygen bonds due to the steric interference by substitutions more conformation will be more stable than others for amylose and glycogen the most stable 3d structure is a tightly coiled helix stabilized by interchain hydrogen bonds the highly branched structure of glycogen offers many advantages such as the non reducing ends present on the outermost tire can act as a substrate for glycogen phosphorylase many glycogen phosphorylases can work allowing a rapid mobilization of stored glucose as glucose one phosphate the highly branched structure allows stored glucose to exert a much lower osmotic pressure than it would exert if it were in its monomeric form hepatocytes store an amount of glucose in free form would have a concentration of 0.4 m against a glycogen concentration of 0.01 m if gl glucose were in free form the resulting osmolarity would be so elevated to cause an osmotic entry of water that would lead to cell lysis branches allowed the formation of compact granules if branches were absent or at least few a very large number of long linear polymers would have to be present to have a number of non reducing ends comparable to those present in glycogen and to store a comparable amount of glucose this could cause cell damage starches are uh, polysaccharides formed by units of glucose and the storage form of carbohydrates in plants it is synthesized by the most part of vegetables cells and stored specially in seeds for example cereals and legumes tubers for example potatoes roots which includes the carrots and some fruits it is one of the three most common dietary carbohydrates and is the main source of carbohydrate in a mediterranean type diet as the human body stores glucose as glycogen plant cells store glucose as starches long branched or unbranched chains of hundreds or thousands of glucose molecules linked together these joint starch molecules are packed side by side in grains such as wheat or rice when you eat the plant your body hydrolyzes the starch to glucose and uses the glucose for its own energy production all starchy food come from the plants grains are the richest food sources of starch providing much of the food energy for the people all over the world rice in asia wheat in canada united states and europe corn in much of uh, central and south america and millet rye barley and oats elsewhere 
legumes and tubers are also important sources of starch starch is a colorless and odorless polysaccharides that is found in plants as a stored carbohydrate it is the polymer of glucose monomers that are linked with each other other to form a polysaccharide starch is composed of two types of polysaccharide molecules one is amylose and other form is amylopectin you have probably got some amylose in your kitchen cupboard like in that box of uh, cornstarch as you probably already know cornstarch is a widely used product that thickens food but did you know that amylose in cornstarch contributes to its thickening property what is the secret ingredient well amylose is a linear polymer chain that contains hundreds to thousands of glucose molecules a polymer is a large molecule that contains many subunits let's take a look at the box of cornstarch as a starch 20 to 25% of its content comes from amylose but what about the other 75 to 80% of its makeup well we will find a different compound called amylopectin amylose is water soluble which contributes to the gelatinous property of starch in other words amylose loves to mingle with water it can help turn a substance such as cornstarch into a thickener if you are wondering what amylose looks like take a look at the amylose check out all those oxygen atoms carbon atoms and ch2oh molecules collectively one sub unit of amylose is called a glucose molecule each glucose or sugar molecules linked to an other by way of a glycosidic bond which is a type of covalent bond covalent bonds form when molecules share electrons glycosidic bonds are important because they link several hundreds or even thousands glucose molecules to form an amylose chain for example the coiled amylose chain in contains more than 500 glucose molecules earlier we identified amylose as a polymer we also found out that a polymer is a gigantic molecule with many subunits keeping what we learned at the beginning of this lesson is mind why would amylose be a polymer well amylose qualifies as a polymer because it is a gigantic molecule formed from several sugar subunits called glucose linked together via actin amylopectin is a large organic molecule usually produced in plant cells that contain repeated units of glucose molecules it is used by plants as a storage molecule to store glucose amylopectin is in the class of biological macromolecules called carbohydrates and it is a polymer formed from its monomer that is glucose amylopectin is stored in plants as temporary granules that can be later broken down by enzymes to release the glucose as it is needed for energy production both plants and animals can break down amylopectin into glucose to use as a source of energy 
as a polysaccharide a myelopectin is a large molecule with hundreds of glucose units in which the units are spaced by two different types of bonds a linear bond and a branched bond that makes a myelopectin a highly branched polymer a myelose and other type of polysaccharide molecules produced by plants is a more linear molecule with fewer branched bonds plant stores these polysaccharide molecules combined into granules the structure of uh, amylose and amylopectin determines how these molecules can change or be used in food products did you know about potatoes which you can use to make an awesome batch of french fries contain a molecule called amylopectin not just potatoes but other starchy products like rice wheat and corn all contain this molecule amylopectin is a type of polysaccharide that has a variable structure built from multiple glucose units a polysaccharide is a molecule that has more than one sugar unit amylopectin is one half of the structure of starch starch is a type of carbohydrate that contains two different polysaccharides if amylopectin is one polysaccharide of starch can you guess what the other polysaccharide is that's right it is amylose to put this in perspective by weight more than 80% of amylopectin makes up a starch molecule to determine the presence of amylopectin in a soluble starch solution the iodine test can be performed if you see the solution turn purple after running this test this will tell you amylopectin is present in starch properties of amylopectin include the fact that this molecule is known to be soluble in water solubility refers to the ability of amylopectin to dissolve in water amylopectin also has two properties that make this molecule quite popular for industry uses bonding well with other compounds and participating in starch retrogradation starch uh, retrogradation is the starch ability to change from a liquid solution to a gel or thickened substances this is due to the rearrangement of the glucose chains in the amylopectin molecules these properties allow the amylopectin to be used in such industry properties as the manufacturing of adhesive and lubricants glycosidic bonds of the starch molecules which is the primary storage form of energy for plants much like humans animals and all living organisms plants need energy so they can grow and function plants use a special process photosynthesis which involves using chlorophyll to convert sunlight carbon dioxide and water into sugar or glucose to be used as energy and extra glucose is stored as starch which the plant can then convert back into glucose when it needs an extra bit of energy in human when we eat starch it is converted to sugar or glucose which can also be used for humans for the purpose of energy 
the cells in our bodies depend on this energy to function making sure that we are able to build and maintain healthy tissues move our muscles and keep our organs working efficiently like plants we are also able to keep unused glucose for use later in the form of glycogen which is mainly stored in the muscles and liver and can be easily converted to glucose when needed foods with a higher amount of amylopectin have a higher glycemic index which means they can cause a quick increase in blood sugar and insulin levels insulin is the hormone that is responsible for the transportation of sugar from the blood to the tissues where it can be utilized when you sustain high levels of insulin over a long period of time it can decrease the effectiveness of insulin leading to insulin resistance and high blood sugar in addition to increase the blood sugar levels a diet high in amylopectin could also negatively impact blood cholesterol levels eating food with a higher glycemic index such as though that are high in amylopectin could decrease the triglycerides and good high, high density lipoproteins cholesterol levels one of the most visible side effect of the amylopectin is its effect on your waistline that's because eating lots of amylopectin can increase insulin leading to the increase in visceral fat insulin plays a major role in fat storage and metabolism it blocks the breakdown of fat and increases the uptake of triglyceride from the blood into the fat cells sustaining high levels of circulating insulin can cause insulin resistance as well as an increase in fat storage and a decrease in fat burning eating foods with a high glycemic index such as those with a high ratio of amylopectin can increase hunger and the risk of overeating amylopectin contain uh, foods may be include short grain rice white bread white potatoes cookies crackers rice corn flakes rice flakes mylose and amylopectin differ in the type of the bonds linking the glucose unit in each polysaccharide amylose has almost exclusively linear 1,4 glycosidic bonds and amylopectin has both 1,4 and 1,6 glycosidic bonds amylose and amylopectin are both made by the enzymes of starch biosynthesis in most plants and then stored together in large complexes called starch granules for long term storage in the plants in plants such as uh, corn and potatoes storage granules are found in the tuber below ground in potatoes and in the seeds of corn plants can break down these starch granules with enzymes such as amylase when the plant needs to release glucose units for energy animals that consume starchy plant parts can also break down or digest granules the properties of the starches when cooked into food 
are affected by the structure of the amylose and amylopectin found in the particular plant starch. Amylose and amylopectins share some similarities but are also drastically different in the ways that they are digested and processed in the body. The difference between these two starch molecules start with their physical structure. Amylose is long and linear while amylopectin is made up of thousands of branches of glucose units. Starch contain both of these carbohydrates. The ratio can make a major impact on the way it's digested and processed. This is because amylopectin is more easily digested and absorbed than the amylose. While this may should sound like a good thing, it actually means that eating foods rich in this carbohydrate can lead to spikes in blood sugar, insulin and cholesterol levels, as well as increased belly fat. A high amount of amylopectin can also increase the glycemic index of foods, which is a measure of how much blood sugar levels increase after consumption. Food high in amylose tend to have higher levels of resistant starches. Resistant starches is a type of the starch that is not completely broken down or absorbed by the body resistant starch has been shown to reduce fat storage, increase stity, lower cholesterol levels and blood sugars and improve insulin sensitivity. It is best to min minimize your intake of food high in amylopectin and instead focus on selecting the starches that have a higher ratio of amylose to ensure you are getting the most health benefits possible from your diet which has been an integral part of our history since ancient times early documentation on the use of starch is limited egyptians supposedly used a starchy adhesive to stick pieces of the papyrus together as far back as 4000 bc while in 312 AD, starch helped prove useful in preventing ink penetration in Chinese paper. Although starch has been a dietary and industrial staple for centuries, it is only in the last several hundred years that we have come to understand more about its unique characteristics and the way that amylose and amylopectin function in the body. In the 1940s, scientists developed more accurately technique to separate the amylose and amylopectin from starch molecules and began studying the highly branched structure of amylopectin. They were able to discover the amylopectin enzyme that contributes to the synthesis and breakdown of starch which helped them understand the complexities of its structure even more. One research into the different type of starch has also been fairly recent in the 1970s. For example, the concept of resistant starch was initially created the year later. The Commission of the European Communities officially funded research to form an official definition of resistant starch. As our knowledge about starch continues to increase, we have begun to learn more about how this important dietary component can affect many different facets of health.